morning and welcome. This is a webinar, a series we're doing on ICT and agriculture, uh, looking at ways we can use ICT to increase the reach and impact of our ag development efforts. By ICT, I mean information communications technologies, which includes everything from mobile phone, voice and text applications, low-cost video, radio, TV, and more. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on an ongoing public-private partnership that we have between USAID uh, with Africa Bureau funding and Vodafone. Um, we have several multi-donor activities um, related to ICT and ag that focus on ICT and extension services, but this alliance we're focusing on today uh, is working with a different set of ICT applications that leverage Vodafone's success with M-Pesa in Africa. Mike Elliott, our project director at TechnoServe, which is our implementing partner for this alliance, will speak first. He'll describe the alliance and progress so far. Then Laura Crow, our contact person and lead for Vodafone, will speak for a few minutes on Vodafone's perspective on the alliance and what Vodafone is doing with it and will carry on from it. Then Mike will return with some lessons learned so far in the alliance leading into some lively discussion, I hope, with all those that you are attending um, in questions and answers. So Mike, do you want to start? Thanks, Judy. Uh, welcome, everyone. So I'll start off just giving a quick overview of what the, the program is. Um, the Connected Farmer Alliance, as Judy mentioned, was a partnership between Vodafone USAID and TechnoServe. It started in 2012, and we'll be wrapping up um, the first phase at the, the end of this year, most likely. Um, it came out of some work that Vodafone did earlier on, looking at opportunities for, for Vodafone in the agriculture space. Uh, and what they saw was that there was a real business case for doing, for doing MAGRI solutions, particularly around the B2B space, which at that point had not been overly explored by too many solutions. Uh, so Vodafone then pulled in TechnoServe, and, and TechnoServe, um, which is who I work for, is, a, is an international NGO that's really focused on agriculture. We've spent many years in ag. Um, and so we were going to help with the interface, of, um, interface to the agriculture sector, and then USAID came in uh, really as a thought partner and also as a funding partner for this. Uh, the goal for the partnership was to increase productivity and, re and re revenue and resilience for about half a million smallholder farmers across three markets. And that's Kenya, Tanzania, and Mozambique. And we picked those three markets because they're different stages of uh, mobile maturity, if you will. Kenya is obviously uh, in the lead in many regards for mobile, including mobile money. Tanzania has been a fast follower in that regard. And Mozambique is, is still at the beginning of the journey in many respects. Uh, M-Pesa just launched in the last year, year and a half. Um, so they're, they're more at the beginning of this. Um, so we're looking at, at really increasing uh, benefits for farmers and also for agribusinesses. Uh, and we think they're an important actor in this value chain. And so we wanted to include them very early on as, as somebody that we want to focus on creating benefits for. So what the program did is it really looked at three different areas, three different products and services. Uh, the first, and, and what I would say is the core of this program, is something called the Connected Farmer, uh, which is a mobile supply chain solution that, we, that enables agribusinesses to engage more effectively with smallholder farmers. And I'll go in a bit more detail of what exactly that solution is. But we've spent the better part of the last, the last two and a half years designing piloting and now de commercially deploying this solution. We've also spent time uh, scaling up mobile financial services uh, with smallholder farmers. And that's been particularly uh, Linda Jimmy here in Kenya, which is a mobile health insurance product, uh, and Empower in Tanzania, which is a mobile savings and credit product. And finally, we've also been looking more broadly at the, at the MAGRI vast sector. Uh, one of the things that Vodafone went into the outset with the mindset of was that they could build a hub for agriculture with Connected Farmer, but wouldn't it be great if we could link in other services to that hub, other entrepreneurs, service providers who have great ideas for agriculture. And so we've been exploring that a bit as well over the last couple of years. Uh, let me talk a little bit now about that first piece which I was talking about, which is the Connected Farmer Supply Chain Solution, what exactly that does. Uh, 
the, the key to understand here, the, the first thing to understand here is that the market, the customer for the connected farmer solution is really agribusinesses, um, not farmers themselves. So we look at agribusinesses who engage directly with smallholder farmers, who source directly from smallholder farmers, and we enable them to do it more effectively. And that really is three pieces of core functionality for us. Uh, the first is farmer data management. So help these businesses understand who their farmers are, where they are, what they're doing, and then drive business analytics from that. So wouldn't it be great if you knew average acreage, um, if, you're a rice, if you're a rice processor, wouldn't it be great to know how many acres are under rice cultivation, where that is, um, what time of the season this is for them. Uh, and that can really drive and help you as a business be a little stronger. The second is around communications. So be able to share information with your farmers and gather information from them. Um, that can be very simple logistics information, such as uh, we're going to be in the village next week, uh, come by to talk. Or it could be agronomy information, like now is a good time to lay fertilizer. Uh, it can also be data collection. Uh, so you could send out a, a note saying, is your, is your maize knee high? And then take those responses back and analyze them and give you a sense as to where in the season you are in particular areas of, the, of your market. And finally, and I, I think this is a really core part and one of the key differentiators of the Connected Farmer solution, is that you can drive transactions over our platform via M-Pesa. Uh, and that is primarily payments, although it can also be uh, loan management disbursements of loans and, and receiving. And I'll talk uh, through in, in this next slide, then a simple use case then for the payment module. And the use case here is that you've got an agribusiness buyer out at a buying center, um, and a farmer comes up to sell their, their product. And maybe this is rice patty, maybe this is uh, macadamia nuts. Um, what the buyer does, and I'm looking at point two now on the slide, is the buyer can, can take the farmer's data, put that into their Android device. Um, so they'll put the mobile number of the farmer in there, and they'll put the quantity of product uh, delivered in there. Um, it will then typically show the farmer and confirm that, that this is correct, that it's the right mobile number, it's the right amount, um, and then they submit it. And the farmer gets paid instantaneously via M-Pesa. And the farmer will also receive a, a receipt. And this is very simple, but it's incredibly powerful. Uh, if you think about what that means for these value chains, you are very quickly now pulling cash out of the system and drastically increasing the transparency and visibility for the businesses into field level operations. So these businesses can now sit in their home office and see real time what's going on in buying centers, what's going on in the field during harvest um, or during marketing season. Uh, it also allows them to pull a lot of cash out of the system, which drastically reduces the amount of fraud, that's p the potential for fraud, I would say. Uh, and for farmers, there's real benefits in getting paid digitally. Uh, it's safer. Um, in many value chains, it's actually, there's some real hard savings around not having to travel to collect your payment. Um, We've also seen, interestingly enough, for women that when they get paid digitally, they actually have greater control of their assets. It's easier for them to, uh, to refuse requests from family and friends for, for money if it's, if it's already in digital format. Um, so that's, that's what we've been doing then, is, is this solution. It, it's a cloud-based solution. Uh, so it sits, uh, sits in the cloud. As a user, you would access it for the agribusiness via the web. Um, their field staff would access it via an Android device, an Android application. Uh, and as a farmer, uh, you can access it via just very basic phones. And most of the farmer interaction for these systems is via SMS uh, or via receiving M-Pesa. So we want to be very cognizant of the technology that exists today in the field, and we think the system is responsive to that. Um, this is just a real quick screenshot of, of what that Android uh, what that Android app looks like for the payments. And I, what I would just emphasize here is it's very simple, and that's everything we want to do with these solutions is keep them simple so that they get used. In this case, this is what a, a buyer would see, um, auto-generated receipt number. He would have previously registered for a buying center just to say where he's actually doing purchase. Uh, oftentimes, they're purchasing more than one crop type, so he would identify what crop he's doing. And then the two things he needs to enter every single time uh, is the farmer number, because that's the unique identifier and that links to the M-Pesa and the weight of the product. You can also tailor this, if you want to, to add a couple other fields like quality, but we think it's, it, in many ways it works best when you keep it simple so that they can do these transactions very easily. 
Um, progress to date. So when we, when we did this from the outset, we always knew that the, the product, the connected farmer solution, uh, which is owned by Vodafone, so the, the IP is owned by Vodafone, um, we wanted it to be a commercial solution. Um, and I think that's crucial when you think about sustainability in MAGRI in general. Uh, who owns it? And ideally, it's, it's someone in the private sector, and how are they making money from it? Um, because that's what will ensure and continued investment in these products. Uh, so from the outset, these products have been owned by, by Vodafone, and they've been owned, uh, most importantly, by Vodafone's commercial team, not their CSR team. So to date, we've actually signed three commercial contracts. Uh, we've got Olam, about 50, Olam Tanzania, uh, with about 50,000 farmers across three value chains. Uh, Kenya Nut, with about 50,000 farmers here in Kenya, doing primarily macadamia, a bit of cashew as well, and in Doonberry Dairy. Um, in the dairy sector in Kenya is interesting. There's a lot of small dairies, but in aggregate, uh, the numbers get very interesting in dairy in Kenya. And we've also got three commercial contracts in progress. Another dairy, uh, Alliance Ginnery, which is a cotton gin in Tanzania, and Tanga Fresh, which is a dairy in Tanzania. We've got about, so if you add up all the, the, the businesses that we've signed up to date, it's a little over 100,000 farmers. Um, some of these have just come online recently, and we're still, we're still onboarding all their farmers. So to date, we've onboarded about 10,000 farmers onto the system, um, dispersed about 150,000 via M-Pesa in the system, and sent out over 600,000 SMSs, uh, which are both a combination of receipts and information to farmers. Um, at the beginning, I talked about the, a couple of different products and services we're doing as part of CFA, so Connected Farmers, a core part of it, but we're also scaling up digital financial services uh, with Vodafone in Tanzania and Kenya. And so Empower, which is the savings and credit product in Tanzania, we've trained almost 20,000 farmers to date. Um, and about 4,300 of those that we've trained have started to actively save. We define active as, as somebody who's done a transaction in the last 90 days. And that's really interesting. The, the role of TechnoServe there has been really about adapting the go-to-market strategy and the marketing materials for these products to the ag sector and to rural communities. Um, and so we're testing a, a methodology by which we do a bit more intensive uh, training with farmers around financial literacy, around savings, um, and particularly then around the products themselves to see if we can drive adoption and then usage for the products. Uh, in Kenya, we've been doing that with Linda Jumi, which is uh, the mobile health insurance product, and we're just starting to roll that training out now. Great, so um, that's a, a bit of an overview, and I'll hand it over now to Laura Crow from Vodafone to talk a little bit about uh, how they've been seeing this partnership. So, Laura? Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining today. So, uh, yeah, from Vodafone's perspective, so um, I think like all great things, uh, the reason behind GoMed is behind this is part uh, strategy, part accident. So to give some of the um, context, we were increasingly thinking of how we look at our products and services to increase our rural penetration base. Um, so uh, obviously uh, penetration was getting higher even in emerging markets as a, a core growth area for us um, in our kind of more urban settings. So we're looking to see how we can uh, grow the business uh, and on less reached areas. And we also had a successful uh, service that had got us off the ground in Turkey um, at the time. It's been done by the Turkish operations that was um, proving a successful content um, service to farmers um, and the time-specific tariff. Um, so off the back of that, we commissioned some research in 2011 to, with the purpose to really put some kind of framework behind that um, as uh, Mike was saying, to get a much better idea of the numbers, what the business case potentially could be, um, and what the size of the impact and role mobile could play in this sector. Um, so we did a piece of research that was launched in 2011 um, around connected agriculture. Um, and off the back of that, we decided this should be an area that um, Vodafone should invest some more time and effort into to trying to bring products to this segment. Um, we were very kind of aware from that point in time that some things that we needed to work with others to really deliver. Uh, we're not experts in the agriculture vertical. Uh, we know quite a lot about technology, uh, service delivery, and, and distribution, really. Um, but 
uh, not for that vertical. So having kind of had a successful partnership um, in the past um, with M-Pesa, uh, M-Pesa was originally started um, in partnership with DFID, we're very open to the idea of um, working with different partners to bring this uh, to the fore. But what uh, we were kind of keen in this partnership with the Connected Farmer Alliance with um, both Technoserve and uh, USAID is that um, it kind of brought that partnership even further in that um, the investment here could go to Technoserve to provide that guidance around where mobile should be focusing on that agricultural value chain um, so they could do that direct research with the farmers, understanding kind of the pain points, the pain points of the businesses to really prioritize where technology has a, a better role and actually we could invest with Vodafone um, in the areas we, much, we know much better around kind of the software um, technology design um, and then also the kind of the go-to-market planning um, as the product can formalize. So um, the partnership structure worked very well for us because people had kind of clear defined goals of what they would bring um, uh, bring to to each side of it and then how there could be a future plan kind of post the partnership to make sure that it was a product that we could um, scale and move forward with. So it can tick from the right boxes from our side. Um, so over the past couple of years, it's been a learning curve as all these initiatives are. Um, Mike's given a great overview of kind of the capability of the product um, and where we are today. Um, but I think for us, it's kind of been uh, there's been a lot of learnings in terms of uh, the the type of pain points where um, mobility can make a difference. Um, but I would say equally a lot around the operations of what needs to be done um, in order to to support businesses in taking that change management approach, approach when they uh, adopt technology and start using technology. Um, and also how some of the benefits that we see through um, the technology that we have been able to provide um, might be in areas that businesses also aren't always aware of um, the cost of the current challenges um, that they experience. So, for example, like one of the services that um, Mike talked about is this ability to real-time pay um, farmers through um, M-Pesa, uh, which has kind of huge benefits to the businesses in terms of reducing the cost of cash and for farmers and increasing security. Um, but very few businesses could articulate the current cost of cash that they might be having in terms of um, hiring their own vans, the security teams, um, to go out into the field. So sometimes, it's, from a commercial perspective, it's a slightly different conversation because we're not coming from a baseline of having complete data to be able to say this is what the intervention is going to do. Um, we're actually still kind of working on that baseline with organizations and to really understand kind of the current legacy costs um, and how this is going to uh, improve um, prove their operations as a solution. Um, and that's what we've been hoping to do with some of the first implementations we've done with the market and something we're hoping to really continue to drive forward um, so organizations can feel the benefit of the service um, and we see the benefits to farmers as well. Um, so for us, it's really critical that we always have the, the mindset of how we, how, we, uh, how we look at those, quantify those, to really try and um, drive uh, drive the commercial viability of the product going forward. So I think I'll um, pause there on kind of our initial um, perspective and hand back to to Mike um, and look forward to you know, the conversations and questions uh, later. Great, thanks, Laura. I wanted to just highlight a couple of the key lessons we've learned over the last couple of years going, going through this partnership. Um, the first has to do with working with MNOs on on mobile solutions for ag. And I'd say it's, it's been very important, we've realized very quickly, it's really important to find the right context and decision makers within an OPCO. An OPCO, sorry for the lingo, uh, an operating company or, or the local arm of the MNO, the mobile operator in country. So finding the right context and decision makers within the OPCO can take time, but it's, it's really crucial to success and to start early. 
we were really lucky with the partnership to, to be working through Vodafone Group. Um, and Vodafone Group you know, sit, you know, sits at the group level, as it sounds, uh, on top of a lot of the operators. And so that's given us access into the operators to the right people. Um, so we've been working with Laura and her team, and they've then introduced us into the local teams in each of our three markets. Uh, but we've realized quickly as well that you need to you need to establish your own relationships as the implementer with those local teams as well. Um, and so we've uh, so we've we've over the course of the last couple of years been able to develop those relationships with the commercial department, and I think that's been crucial to our success then. Um, also, we, I'd say you, you need to, with these kind of partnerships, with these public-private partnerships, it's really important to, that the partners are honest very early on as about what their incentives are for being in the partnership. Um, and that really drives that sustainability. These products and projects are only sustainable when everyone receives enough value uh, to, to continue their engagement. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the, the key parts of, of Vodafone's engagement was via that report, the Connected Agriculture, where they actually created a, or identified the high-level business case uh, for them to go into this space. So what are the actual potential revenues that could come in? And to me, that was really key because that meant that when we started this partnership with them, we were, part, we were linked into their commercial team and not their CSR team. And it's not that Vodafone isn't interested in the commercial aspects or the, the community relation aspects of this. It's just that for them, it's also really a core part of their business. Um, and that was important. So for Vodafone, from the outset, their incentive was to drive a, a commercial product out of this. And for TechnoServe and USAID, it was really about a, a sustainable and scalable way for engaging the smallholder farmers and driving benefits for smallholder farmers. And I think it's important to be honest about that from the beginning with these sort of partnerships. Um, something around impact I think is important to note, uh, which is that impact tends to lag behind um, implementation a fair bit for these types of solutions. Part of that is just a, a reality of working in agriculture. So when you're working in a seasonal sector like egg uh, and you launch right after harvest, it, it may be a year before you can even start working, um, start selling your product into the marketplace. Because if you sell it right after harvest, there, there might not be the, the interest in it. So part of it's around agriculture and part of it is around, um, for many businesses, we think the benefits of using the solution will actually occur in year two of use, uh, not necessarily in the first year of use. And that's because in the first year, they're still testing the solution a little bit, and they'll often run dual systems for their business. They'll often do a little bit of M-Pesa payments and a little bit of cash payments as they feel out the system. Um, and that sometimes can mean that actually their costs go up in year one. Uh, and it won't be until year two, until full adoption and full buying of the solution, that you'll start seeing some of the real benefits. So I would just, I would just make sure that people are going out with their eyes wide open in terms of when they expect to see benefits for these types of solutions. It, it takes time. Um, another point I would say is that capacity building is, is oftentimes required with these types of ICT solutions for both the businesses and farmers in order for them to get full value. I think going into it, we knew that farmers were going to require that. Um, we expected that farmers would require a, a bit of training um, if we were expecting them to be active users of the solution. I think we were a, a bit surprised at the beginning about the, the amount of capacity building the businesses required uh, to get the full value. And that's because you realize quickly that these solutions require businesses to change their internal processes, to change their operations. Um, if you're moving from paper-based systems to digital systems and, to, and from cash systems to um, you know, mobile, mobile money payment systems, that means that the way they do business is, is different. Uh, and so there's actually been a, a big part of the role that TechnoServe has been playing over the last couple of years is, is helping to train these businesses and, and, and help them through the process of adapting to these new types of digital solutions. And finally, and, and this is last, but I think this is actually one of the most important, is that uh, we learned very quickly that digital payments can really be transformative for the egg sector. Um, they, there's just an incredible increase in the amount of transparency and an incredible reduction in the amount of fraud that happens when you move from paper and cash systems into digital systems. Um, for farmers, that's great. It, they, they, the amount of trust they have now with these businesses goes up because they, they don't think they're getting, um, well, they just, they just know that there's a lot more transparency going on. They, they know that the amount of product they're, they're selling into the system is actually identified by the businesses and going to the businesses. Um, 
I'd say one note here on the digital payments, which I thought is, is really interesting, and we've seen this in Mozambique early, which is when you do digital payments in ag, you need to think a bit holistically about how digital payments will affect the full digital ecosystem. And the concern there can be that digital, that ag payments can be large and they can be lumpy. They come at one time of the year and there can be a lot of money in the system. And in markets like Mozambique, where the mobile money ecosystem is still growing, that can put strains on liquidity in the system. And so as we start doing more digital payments in agriculture, I would encourage us to think holistically about how we can incentivize farmers to keep those payments digital for as much as possible. And maybe that's a savings product. Um, maybe that's simply incentivizing through the, the mobile wallets we see today. But the more of that money, the more of those payments that we can keep digital for significant periods of time, the easier it is uh, to roll these systems out and the less strain we're going to put on the, on the mobile money system in general. And with that, I will hand back to, to Judy now. Thanks, Mike and Laura. Before I switch to the questions from all of you um, online, I wanted to just uh, mention a couple of lessons I've seen and learned. The first one relates to what Mike just mentioned and digital payments. I thought Vodacom, Vodafone has succeeded with uh, M-Pesa, so of course farmers are using mobile money. And of course agribusinesses are. But it turns out it's been much harder for them to do so for some of the reasons Mike just mentioned. And also these, these agribusinesses had to have all those farmers registered in a database, not only to figure out who they're paying, but also to, uh, to uh, uh, excuse the church bells, uh, uh, to make sure that they were able to net out the loan amount um, uh, so that they paid the right amount to each farmer. Um, and that helped them avoid side selling for the farmers. So that registration process and netting out the loans and, as Mike said, having angel, uh, agents that could handle the lumpy payments because of the ag cycle were huge barriers for ag to actually take advantage of mobile payments. The second point is one Mike also made on business models. And I was, um, again, impressed that the mobile operators were interested in figuring out the business models, but it wasn't something they were already doing, uh, certainly not in agriculture. So uh, this partnership was able to bring to the table of the, of the operating companies um, ag expertise to figure out what the model might look like on both sides to actually make this a service that was commercially viable for the operating company and valuable enough to pay for for the agribusiness. And the third insight is that uh, the, the relationship between the Vodafone uh, group, uh, which Laura represents, and the operating companies. Clearly, Vodafone group can uh, fund various market research studies on what the opportunities are, what the business cases are. But when it comes right down to it, the operating companies in each country are the ones that can decide what they're actually going to do. And they can learn from each other, but each one has their own uh, bottom line uh, to figure out and hold to. And finally, I'll just make a comment that Mike has mentioned uh, moving into savings products. Those are That's an area that I'm especially interested in so that farmers can, as they increase their productivity based on ag development efforts, they can learn to save and handle the cash flow across the uh, crop cycle better so they aren't dependent on getting loans from agribusinesses. So now we'll turn to some questions uh, from the audience. See if I can grab something interesting. Um, the first is from Loretta uh, at uh, Lutheran World Relief. She asks, how applicable is connected farmer uh, to cooperatives as they have an agribusiness function of bulking, collective uh, inputs, et cetera. Um, Mike, do you have some comments on that? Great, thanks, Judy. Uh, so I think they're very applicable to cooperatives. And two of the, the businesses we're actively working with right now, one of which is signed the contract, are dairy cooperatives. Uh, and I think your point around that they act as aggregators is exactly right. They are, they are in many ways an agribusiness in, in the sense that they source from smallholder farmers, they provide a set of services to those farmers. Um, 
What's interesting, I think, in, with cooperatives, particularly dairy cooperatives in Kenya, is that many of them have over time created SACOs or um, financial institutions linked to the cooperatives. And in there, the value of Connected Farmer might not totally be the mobile money aspect of it, but it might be more around the transparency of it, um, the transparency of the transactions. So we've seen in dairy in Kenya um, that one of the key values of our solution is these daily receipts that go to dairy farmers who deliver their milk to the cooperative. And in the old world, they would deliver milk every day, um, but they wouldn't get any confirmation of how, mi how much milk they delivered. And then at the end of the month, they would get a consolidated statement saying, we've delivered this much milk over the, the past month. Uh, and if a farmer thought there was a discrepancy in between what they delivered and what they were getting paid for, it's very hard for them to address that. And so what this solution has done now is, is give a farmer a daily SMS receipt around the amount of milk that's been delivered. So every day the farmer can say, they get the receipt saying, today you've delivered 10 liters of milk. And so if there's a discrepancy, they can find it that day and address it. Um, so I think, it's, I think this solution is, is, becomes really interesting for cooperatives, those without finan linked financial institutions and those that, that happen to have financial institutions as well. Um, they also become very interesting in uh, many of these cooperatives will actually run small shops uh, or give farmers a uh, product on credit um, through, through a checkoff system is how we think about it in Kenya. And the system can help manage those those loans to farmers, that credit to farmers, and also that checkoff system. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. I wanted to make one other comment about the Alliance. We were, one of the side benefits of the Alliance was that we were hoping to use it in as, as an example for learning for other, other mobile network operators. Uh, clearly, 80% of, of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa is in farming, so mobile network operators are interested in that market and figuring out how to get into it. Um, Vodafone, of course, uh, stepped out ahead with this uh, alliance, and we see others, Airtel and Orange, for example, uh, moving into um, mobile ag services as well. Certainly they're not copying uh, Vodafone, but I think it's good that these different operators can watch each other and see that momentum is actually increasing across uh, mobile network operators for mobile ag services. So we have a question from Nina at the World Bank. And Mike, I think this is for you again. She asks, what is the role of the national government where CFA is operating in terms of implementation? Uh, for example, to which extent were they involved? Um, were there any regulatory or policy obstacles to the implementation of the project? So for our project, we haven't done a lot of direct engagement with the government. Uh, part of that is because the local opcos in each of our markets have already have a license to operate, um, are already doing value-added services, um, and so that it's not a, it's, it's not that we're a new entity doing something kind of brand new. We are we are piggybacking in many ways on the relationships that the that that Vodafone and their opcos already have with the government. Um, I think what gets interesting is that some of these solutions can be useful to the government. And we've actually seen this now in Kenya where parts of what we've developed as Connected Farmer um, are, are finding applicability in, in work that the government is trying to do in the egg sector. So I think it's good to keep them informed. I think it's definitely important that they know what's going on. Um, it hasn't been something that we've kind of directly fostered as part of CFA. We've simply, we've, we've in many ways leveraged the existing relationships. Uh, that Vodafone had. Thanks, Mike. Jan from um, Medway in the UK asked a two-part question. Uh, the first is about the commercial benefits. Uh, the, the commercial benefits of the system are clear to both Vodafone and the participating companies, but he's especially interested in the social impact on the farmers. And perhaps you can mention uh, what you're working with on a line on that one, Mike. The second question is one that I have struggled with, and, and that is, do you feel it is necessary uh, to have a partnership with an, a mobile network operator to create such a service, or could something similar um, be set up using over-the-top systems? Actually, I'm not sure what over-the-top means, but as a USAID um, uh, ICT advisor, I certainly uh, thought a lot about whether this was a good use of government funds. I uh, 
and I consulted a lot with our public-private partnership experts. Vodafone is bringing to the table over $5 million of resources, um, matching $5 million from USAID. So that was a, a serious contribution by Vodafone. Uh, they were also in agreement that uh, lessons would be learned, they would be um, open to uh, things like webinars and things like that to participate in and to work with um, uh, TechnoServe and USAID on learning about ag. So we decided to go ahead given their contribution and what we might be able to get out of it and the example that we could uh, show to other mobile network operators. It is a good question and a hard one uh, to know the right answer on, but that's how we came out. So uh, Mike, would you like to comment on the question about impact on smallholder farmers and anything in addition you'd like to comment on whether this partnership is a good use of public funds? Great, thanks, Judy. I'll start with the easier one around farmer benefits. Um, so I think for farmers, there's a there's there's a, a portfolio of different benefits they that we think they're seeing. Uh, part of that is around increased revenues. Uh, some of that is due directly to less fraud from output. So there's a, there's a lot of just, and this isn't unique, I don't think, to, to Kenya or Tanzania, but there's there's significant fraud within the egg value chains, and that's because a lot of a lot of the the payments right now are done by cash, and, and a lot of the records are kept via paper, um, and so it's very easy for things to disappear. Um, and so we think that by increasing the visibility and transparency in these systems, more of that money is going to get into the, the pocket of the farmer. Um, and some of our early indicators, some of the early assessments we've done is, have said that's very much true. Um, we also see direct or uh, decreased transaction costs for farmers. So in some value chains, farmers are actually having to make separate trips to go pick up money. Uh, we see this in Tanzania. We have one of our clients, one of our earlier clients was with Multiflower. They're a flower seed exporter based out of uh, uh, the Netherlands. And the way that their, the way their business worked is farmers would drop off seed, they'd go home, they'd come back later to pick up a first payment, they'd go home, they'd come back later to pick up a second payment. This is over the course of several months. Um, and because we are doing mobile money payments then to these farmers or mobile money disbursements to these farmers, they didn't have to take those physical trips. So they actually saved money on transportation and they actually were, the security was higher as well. So they weren't, they weren't uh, at the risk of getting robbed during these, these trips. Um, we also think there's a lot of value around improved visibility into the status and details of delivery um, and loan and payments. So just knowing where things are in the system, I'm going to get paid. Maybe I haven't gotten paid yet, but there's a payment coming. Um, that's really important to them. Uh, it enables people to send uh, farmhands perhaps to go do some of these transactions because the money instead of going to the farmhand and then trusting the 100% of that money is going to get back to the farmer, um, the money will go directly into, the, into the, the real farmer's mobile wallet. So we think there's something around visibility into that as well. And finally we think that uh, we see that businesses are using the system to actually send more information to farmers. Uh, and some of this information is directly related to productivity, so it's information around good agricultural practices. And so sharing more of that information, just, uh, being able to distribute that content, we think is going to have a real benefit on farmers. Um, and some of this I'm kind of using soft language on, and that's because we haven't done a full-scale evaluation yet, getting back to my, my lag between benefits and implementation. Uh, so we've got a, a firm right now in country that's that's going out in the field and looking at the benefits. And so a lot of the early indicators you've seen that these things are true and, and what we're going to try to do now over the next couple of weeks is quantify them. And we'll be sharing those out once we have that. And I think that'll be really interesting to be able to, to really say with some, some certainty what the value is to the farmers and to the agribusinesses. In terms of is this a good use of public funding, you know, I think there's, there's a real value in showing, in proving business models in this space. It, I think a lot of the work in MAGRI uh, to date has not proven to be scalable and has not proven to be profitable. And I think it's really hampered MAGRI's, the promise of MAGRI, it's hampered its ability to, to really do some transformation in the sector. And so what we're ha hoping to do is, is prove with, a, with Vodafone that these business models, particularly these B2B models and these transactional models, uh, can be a great way to play in this space and can, and can actually be a hub in many ways to other services that go direct to farmer. So if I think about how we operate, 
our customers are, are agribusinesses, but we are registering lots of farmers on these platforms. These, these agribusinesses are registering farmers on these platforms. And once you have these farmers registered, you can start offering them a, a range of services. And those services might be content, um, they might be digital financial services related to agriculture, um, or they might be other services we haven't even thought of yet. Um, but you can use this as a hub and then you can, you can bolt on other services to it. And I think proving that hub model as well to the broader marketplace becomes really interesting. So I don't think you have to work with MNO. Um, if, if you're interested in another market and there's other players that are there that make sense, I think that, makes, you know, that, that can work very well. Um, but, but what I think is key is having a partner that's really committed to the space, and that's what we've seen in Vodafone. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, um, just to, I just to jump in on that question as well, and um, from a Vodafone's perspective, a super question around um, over-the-top players. Um, I would add, and maybe I would kind of rephrase the question a little bit to kind of put the point in that Vodafone here is a partner around some of the technology delivery, but I often say technology in C solutions are actually some of the least important parts of getting right. The technology is very simple, and I do think there is um, a role for different types of players um, to be delivering these types of solutions um, and taking kind of the first step at this. I'm sure lots of other players will come into the market and it will be a vibrant, competitive place. Um, so I think what our finding is and what I always kind of um, emphasize in any kind of initiative where um, technology is being used is to kind of um, emphasize whether it's kind of M-Pesa, whether it's these new solutions or different applications. The habit isn't designing um, functionality that is A to B. It's about um, educating that customer about what it does. It's about them building the trust around what that service does and then um, being able to do that change management process um, as people move from one um, way of doing something to another. Uh, so that needs kind of presence on the ground. And I, I feel that somewhere telcos do add value in terms of the trust in the market, the presence of our retail distribution, increasingly our mobile money distribution, our customer service, and the ongoing customer service we provide with this technology, that frontline support to users to be able to start um, taking the, the product and, and using it. So yes, lots of different players um, should play uh, in the market. It uh, doesn't necessarily have to be an m and um, but I'd say that don't, it's not just about the technology, it's about the service design that's wrapped around that and the service support that's given to, to the end users. Thanks, Mike and Laura. Uh, another question comes from Melanie from Freedom From Hunger. Uh, she says, great to have at least brief mention of the impact on women farmers. Um, do you have any other comments on the impact of women farmers or how that has fit into the alliance, Mike or Laura? Yep, so something we think a, a fair bit about. Um, I think there's two things I would highlight. One is that there's been research that's shown that, that women have greater control of, of their mobile money than they do of cash. Um, this was, I can't remember who did this research, I was just talking about this with UN Foundation the other day. Um, they were looking at particularly women business owners and when, when women business owners were able to keep assets in mobile money, uh, they were able to invest more in their businesses, which was a kind of a proxy of control of those assets. Whereas women who, were, who had most of their assets in cash um, tended to, to not have as much control. So I think that's really interesting, and, and that, that speaks to the digital payments part, the mobile payments part of what we're doing. Um, there's also something interesting, and this is something we've been playing around with a little bit, which is through the system you can start registering not just a primary farmer, but you can also register a secondary household member into the system. Uh, and what we think this is going to be used as, and what we've seen this used as uh, to date, is that men will often own the contract and they'll, they'll be the one that register with the business, but if they sign up their wife, um, that wife can also receive this content then from the agribusiness, the agronomy content, the, the logistics updates. And since women are doing most of the work or much of the work in many of these value chains, that's great um, because we're trying to overcome that challenge where men will go to the trainings but women do the work and so this information you're passing on never actually gets to the person doing the work in the field. Um, so we, we think that the, the solution can help address that as well. 
Um, but it is something we're looking at. It's, it's part of what our evaluators will be looking at over the next couple of weeks is, is are we able to, to create real benefits then for women farmers as well? Thanks, Mike. Jason uh, from uh, TechnoTech asks, I'm interested in hearing more about the structure of the alliance. In broad terms, what activities, actions, and processes uh, were carried about by USA TechnoServe versus Vodafone? Also in terms of resources, what aspects of the project were paid for with USAID resources versus Vodafone's contributions? So I'll start out answering that. Uh, as as uh, Techrotech and others may know, uh, USAID has a public-private partnership process called uh, Global Development Alliances. We receive concept papers, unsolicited ones. We have a broad agency announcement that tells one how to submit a concept paper um, to propose at least a one-to-one -one match of resources from a, um, a public-private partnership partner um, to match USAID's resources. Once we get the concept paper, then we also consult with the missions that are involved in the field that would be touched by the idea. And we can then discuss uh, directly with, uh, the, give feedback to the potential partner and then help shape the actual design of the alliance. In this case, we received a concept paper that actually was uh, uh, developed by Vodafone and TechnoServe together. TechnoServe is what we call the implementing partner. It has a bit of matching funds in there, but mostly it is the recipient of the USAID funds to implement the alliance. And TechnoServe is the resource partner along with USAID. So together, Vodafone and TechnoServe drafted the, uh, the concept paper. Uh, we worked with them to hone it to make sure it was in a line uh, aligned with uh, USAID priorities. And in this case, one, one uh, criteria, of course, was that it was aligned with Feed the Future um, focus countries. So we had to map out where the overlap was between Vodafone country priorities and USAID's. Then we put together an MOU, um, a Memorandum of Understanding, between all three partners. It's not a legally binding um, document, but it is reviewed by counsel on all sides, and it defines our joint goals and objectives, how we'll measure success, and who does what in the alliance. Uh, essentially, USAID's money then goes to um, TechnoServe um, as a cooperative agreement in this case, and then uh, Vodafone's money is either used internally or goes to TechnoServe. So. Uh, Mike can address, or Mike or Laura can address more on the Vodafone side. Great, thanks, yeah, Judy. Yeah. From a Vodafone right, perspective, ahead, just to add on, yes, I was going to say, I mean, so our, pri our priority is investment on um, the building out the technology um, and any cost in running uh, any of the operations, so connectivity, FMS costs for running the trials. So, like direct kind of Vodafone style costs. Great, and and TechnoServe has really been the the field staff then for the project, the field facing oh. element. Um, during the the startup phase, we did a lot of the client identification and needs assessment. So we'd go out there and we'd find agribusinesses who might be good clients for this. It had a certain number of farmers sourced directly from farmers had fairly professional uh, management staff. Um, and then we would, we would conduct a needs assessment with them. So how do you operate, well, something we call a process map in our lingo. How do you source from farmers today? Um, what are the challenges in that, in that engagement with farmers? And then we would look at where could mobile play a part in, in addressing those challenges. Uh, so we would do that. We would feed that back then to Vodafone and their technology team um, to craft Kind of the, the early fit, the early the early uh, pilots of these solutions, um, and then we would take that back out in the field and and TechnoServe would do a, a, for the pilots, especially management of the client and user support. So we'd help the client understand how to use the solution, and then we'd support them as they were using it and if they had challenges. Um, TechnoServe would also then do a lot of the development of training materials and delivering that training to the clients, uh, especially during the project phase. Uh, and then over the next, I would say, eight months. A lot of that work is going to get transitioned to Vodafone um, and to the opcos. 
So we'll start transitioning a lot of the biz dev work to them, um, some of the training and capacity work to them, and then the direct user support. Uh, and that way, at the end of the project, Vodafone will be playing all roles in this system here. Um, so they will be not only the technology, but they'll also be the, the, the client-facing part of it. Thanks, Mike. Um, I might also add that Vodafone is going to be taking up these capabilities, or the Vodacom business um, uh, operating companies in the different countries. And one sign that they're serious about that is that they've actually stolen some of Mike's team to have internally to carry on the practices. So that's that's sort of a, I, I see that as totally good news. Mike has to cope with it. But it is a good sign that Vodacom and Safaricom are serious about this. Uh, Aaron has a good question uh, from Concern Worldwide in Mozambique. Uh, given where M-Pesa actually stands in Mozambique, uh, he's interested in uh, much has been said, uh, mentioned about Kenya and Tanzania. I'm curious to know what the challenges were in implementing the project on the ground in Mozambique. Mike? Great, thanks. So, so Mozambique is obviously a very different market than Tanzania and, and Kenya. Um, mobile money is still very nascent there. Uh, footprint coverage is of the actual network is is not as as high as it is in Tanzania and Kenya. So there are unique challenges in in Mozambique. Um, one of them is around identifying clients that uh, that are in an area where we have good coverage um, and where phone penetration along the populace is high enough. Um, where Vodafone SIM or anyone's SIM penetration is high enough. Um, and that's growing. I mean, that's getting easier day by day. Coverage is, 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 is expanding pretty quickly. Um, but it is still more of a concern than we've seen elsewhere, just kind of basic infrastructure. Uh, I'd say the key one for Mozambique is more around the mobile money side of things, uh, and particularly around liquidity in the field as we think about payments. Um, so if you look at the cotton sector, and the cotton sector is big in Mozambique and is very well organized, uh, so in many ways it's a good fit for our solution. Uh, the cotton sector is great, but the, the size of the payments they often do are quite large. Uh, and if we were to take one of the big cotton firms and move them 100% onto the platform right now, um, do a big payment, and then every farmer goes to an agent to cash out, uh, the, mobile, the, the agent network, the liquidity of the system would, would be under a lot of strain. Um, and so that's one of the areas where we need to think about this incentive, this the digital ecosystem more holistically and in incentivizing farmers to keep their money digitally. Uh, and so I'd say that's the, the biggest challenge we've seen in Mozambique. Laura, I don't know if you want to weigh in any more on that. No, I, I think that you've covered you know, the key areas. Um, I would say um, from a yeah, from a proposition standpoint, the approach that we try to take as a business is try for um, a market to focus on a, a few key things and then start building on um, the services um, once you've kind of built up uh, kind of the first core base. And so from an impressive perspective in Mozambique, given it's been taking a little longer to get off the ground, we haven't wanted to overload too much from a proposition perspective, um, the market. Um, but I think that will increasingly um, uh, speed up now. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see more um, kind of naturally grow uh, in this market as we progress. Thanks, Mike and Laura. On Mozambique, I follow it closely because it's such an important country to USAID, and it's also one of our new alliance ICT Extension Challenge Fund countries. Um, I know that Vodacom does have the, the challenges and struggles that Laura and Mike have mentioned. Uh, it also, though, is moving forward in uh, basic M ag services to farmers uh, through a service uh, with a USAID project related to coastal management. Um, they're going to be implementing a system called 321 uh, from HNI, which is an IVR system for basic ag information as well as coastal uh, flooding information. Um, and that should be starting up very soon. So it's a good sign that they're moving, they want to move into mobile ag services, um, even though on the mobile payment side, it's more of a challenge. 
Mark LeClaire from Farm Radio International, who really should be the one to answer this question, but I'll pose it to you guys. He says, uh, using media, that is mass media, to sensitize farmers and agribusinesses to this type of system could be useful. How might radio help promote and create conversation around um, the Connected Farmer Alliance system? And I might add um, Mike or Laura to comment on how the mobile network operators have marketed this system. Great. Um, I'll take a stab at then, Laura, you can jump in. So m most of what we've done to date in terms of marketing the system has been going directly to agribusinesses. Um, TechnoServer has been in many of these markets for a long time in agriculture, so we have a good sense of, of who's who plays in this space, who are the big agribusinesses, who are the ones that are, are pretty well run. Um, and so that's where we've started. Uh, one of the things about the system is because our customers are agribusinesses and not farmers, we actually don't have to do as much mass marketing for a connected farmer. Um, because we have identify the agribusiness, we sell the solution to the agribusiness and they register their farmers as part of their, as part of their business as usual. Um, so, so I'd say that's actually been a benefit for us in many respects is that we're not fighting what I, I think of as the trench warfare of, of the direct-to-farmer systems have to go through, which is trying to get more and more farmers on and, and that challenge. Uh, that said, you know, it's, always, it's always good to build awareness of what you're doing. Um, radio is obviously a, a good channel to do that. Uh, so I think as we think about scaling this up over time, it's certainly something that would be looked at. Well, I don't know if you want to add any, any more to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I mean, I'm aware that there's some um, great things that Farm Radio are doing with mobile in terms of uh, testing uh, beliefs, testing some of the messages kind of broadcasted so through mobile, kind of doing a poll in terms of um, what are useful um, information that was provided to kind of hone the messaging or um, provide a kind of reinforcement messages post kind of episodes. Um, I believe that's happening. Say I'm not a spokesperson, so I think uh, different channels are converging to uh, broadly to use different channels to reach out to people uh, in the easiest way, and that's kind of very welcome. Um, uh, so I think uh, exploring that is a is a positive thing for many markets. Uh, as Mike said, um, for this particular product, because we've been working with uh, agri business. Um, for this particular one, um, it hasn't been so much of a top piece to, to use that as a, as a channel and a format. But I think, um, as Judy says, we have a kind of a wider portfolio of agricultural services, which we're keen to do, and I'm sure will happen in um, the market, then um, absolutely, I think it's a useful extra channel. Thanks, Mike and Laura. I think I'm going to just pose one more question to you, and in advance, I'll, I'll, I'll thank both of you. And I also would like Laura, before we close, to mention uh, the additional market research that Vodafone has uh, funded uh, related to mobile ag. So the, the question is from Adam of GSMA in the UK. He says, Mike, your point about um, making sure partners are honest about incentives is key. You also mentioned that agribusiness uh, can see different value propositions, for example, understanding real-time buying habits, reducing fraud, or just increasing cost efficiencies using di digital payment systems. What is the leading incentive and KPI for the agribusiness? Is, the, is it the same across different types of agribusinesses? Great, thank you. It's, it's a good question. Um, I don't know if I have the answer to it, to be honest. There's, um, we're still trying to figure out exactly what the best or the, the biggest benefits are to the, the agribusinesses and what those KPIs are to determine their decision or to drive their decision to invest in a solution like this. I think it's a lot around this transparency and visibility. Um, I think it's a, a, it's a lot around pulling cash out of the system. But as I think Laura said earlier, a lot of these agribusinesses haven't themselves quantified the costs associated with these, the costs of cash, the costs of paper-based systems. Um, so I, one of the things we're going to try to do as part of, you know, as part of the evaluation over the next couple of months is to try to quantify some of the value of, of, of addressing those challenges to businesses. Um, and we'll obviously be sharing those out then as, as part of our reports. 
Um, because I, th I think there is a lot of value. Uh, I think uh, the value is real and it has you know, hard impact on the ability to run the business, but we're not always sure and the businesses aren't always sure the magnitude of that value. And so it's something we're really interested in exploring more. Laura, do you have a comment on the market research? Um, no, I think um, I'd agree with uh, with Mike's comments. I think it's something that we that we need to do more more of, uh, and it's something um, that we we also need to work with organizations and, and how they're prepared to share that data as well, because then you are working in a internally in a company that you know that's data. Um, for them, so whether that be information we can publicly share is maybe a different uh, story or which companies are prepared to. But um, uh, definitely uh, that journey of continuing to try and measure the, um, and, and I say measure it in, I guess, a slightly light way in the sense that we do need these statistics, but at the same time from a commercial product, we cannot necessarily have the same rigor of investment on the monitoring and evaluation that ideally some of these products would have, but it's just that's uh, such an additional extra cost in terms of then even like the product design, the OPEX, the go-to-market, the marketing, that it's not necessarily the full role of, I'd say, an m and or any other service provider to do rigorous monitoring and evaluation as well um, to, to, again, control trials, et cetera. But it's definitely something we want to try and continue to see how we can help businesses explore that kind of the current baseline, um, the benefits, and also for the, the farmers to make sure um, that we're capturing that and that's in the service design and it's an iterative process and any gaps missed on the product side that could benefit the farmers and the business is being captured and um, continuing to go into the roadmap of functionality because um, you should probably highlight this is kind of a, a journey and a first step and something we want to start to try and commercialize, but uh, we don't see we've kind of got all the answers from, from this current standing position. And Judy, if I could just jump in one other point here, which is I think one of the, the benefits to these businesses is, is the data itself. And I think that becomes really exciting in, in a broader picture, which is there's going to be all this mobile, all this data collected on farmers and transactions. and as a system, how do we monetize and how do we get the most value out of that data and how do we do that responsibly? I think that's one of the big challenges that's coming up in MAGRI, which is you're going to start seeing a lot of financial data moved onto these systems. You're going to see a lot of very personal data. Um, it has value. It can, it can be used to increase access to finance for farmers. Um, it can be used to tailor content. It obviously can be used for, for not great uses either. So I think this whole idea of how we manage mobile data or just data in general on farmers, um, who owns it, uh, how do we use it most effectively, is going to be a really interesting challenge that this community is going to be facing over the next couple of years. Thank you very much, um, Mike and Laura. This is Judy just winding up the webinar. I think we'll continue in the chat box if you have additional questions. Um, I did want to mention that there are several questions about knowledge sharing and information for farmers. We have ICT and Extension Service activities going, and there's resources in ICT and Ag in AgriLinks, and have a section of AgriLinks called ICT and Agriculture. So you can pose questions there, or you can pose them directly to me at jpain at usaid.gov, so that we can keep moving forward on using ICT well uh, within Ag development. Um. Sorry, Judy. I just wanted to add one thing. From um, there wasn't it. There's an additional external research report that the Vodafone Foundation is doing on um, agriculture that will be launched in May. So also for this um, forum, um, that will be able to come out in the future. It's not available um, as of today to share, um, but in the future, the uh, direct people to that if they're interested in in the topic and uh, what Vodafone's doing. Great. Thank you, Laura. I'm looking forward to that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for a great webinar and for all of the insightful questions. Thank you to Judy Payne for facilitating and arranging. And also, of course, to our wonderful speakers, Michael Elliott from TechnoServe and Laura Crow from Vodafone.